Welcome to the first series of hopefully more to come where we cover automotive projects. We'll be looking at old, new, foreign, domestic, hot rodding projects, some running, some not. This first series is going to cover one of my own personal projects. It's a 1972 De Tommaso Pantera. Uh, around 2011 is when I decided I wanted to make some improvements because the car tended to overheat, which was kind of a classic problem, but mine was simply related to a Windsor thermostat being installed instead of a Cleveland thermostat. So I was intrigued by how much power the car was going to make on a chassis dyno. The motor had been rebuilt with another Cobra Jet 4-bolt main Cleveland block, and it had aluminum heads. They were c 30 uh, b aluminum high ports. These are essentially a developed version of the Boss iron heads. The heads were topped off with an early Motorsport A351 single-plane high-rise intake. Now, a well-built inline-headed 351 Windsor type setup should make close to 360 to 400 wheel horsepower on a chassis dyno. So you can imagine I was fairly disappointed when the engine nosed over at around 5200 RPM to what appeared to be valve float and only making around 300 horsepower and 300 foot-pounds of torque at the wheels. So that brings us to where we are today. Six years later, I no longer have a garage, but I do have a friend who's a professional mechanic with a shop and interested in me finishing this project. So we're about to install a push lock fitting on some push lock hose here. I was heating up the sides of the hose evenly in the vise. And he's also greased the fitting a little bit, so that's really easier to install. These are really tough to install. So the heat will help expand the hose a little bit. And uh, you just got to make sure you push it on pretty evenly. Uh, if you want to get them off, they're a little bit hard to do, but you can cut, uh, you can basically cut it, cut the whole piece off, you know, past the nipple, and then you can get a razor blade and kind of slice, get a, get a cut going, and then you can kind of peel it away from the uh, nipple if you have to remove it. Now we're putting the hose back on. So we actually trial kind of fit and figure out how we wanted to cut it to length. Uh, prior to putting on the actual fittings. I actually routed them up in this fashion because they're, you'll see it when it's mocked up on the engine uh, another photo where you can see the headers. I'm using 180 degree headers which they, they, they call nickname them bundle of snakes and they come out the back of the engine and kind of high up around the valve covers and so if they were too low they'd be really close to the headers and as it is, I'm going to have to use a heat shield on the deck lid of the car to keep the heat from the headers off that. So I may have to fashion some kind of uh, block or aluminum sheeting to kind of keep even these hose uh, away from the engine. So in this case, we're using a crescent wrench because we don't have uh, AN wrenches, but it works just the same. Uh, you can also opt to put maybe a little tissue between the jaws of the uh, the crescent wrench in case you don't want to scuff up the, uh, the fittings themselves. So Lyle's holding the hose in position and retightening all the fittings. That way they'll be sitting kind of where we want them to without having to do some like zip ties or something like that, which, which looks kind of hokey. This is a Weldon regulator. It's got, I think, dash 10 fittings that come out of it. And so I reduced them to dash eight because that is what my rails are. I didn't anticipate the clearance I was going to have between the headers and where the fuel rails extended past the injector on each side of the manifold. So inherently, I found myself trying to tuck the fuel regulator, fuel pressure regulator, as close to the carburetor pad and also low enough so that it would clear a dropped air filter base. We ended up cutting and drilling a bent piece of aluminum to use as a bracket for the regulator and we ended up mounting that on the two bosses that are typically used for a throttle cable bracket. Uh, because the routing of the throttle cable comes from the other side of the motor, I already have a bracket we're going to have to uh, rework to work um, with this intake given the new location of the fuel rails. So it worked out pretty well mounting the regulator at the current position. 
I ended up opting to use a ProComp 4150 throttle body, mostly because the sensors used on this throttle body were going to make it a lot easier to adapt to the pigtail on this older standalone harness. In this episode, I'm starting near the end of the long block assembly. I just gotten the intake back from Kevin Thompson at Hot Rod Solutions. He ended up converting a Motorsport 8331 single plane high rise intake over to EFI. He added uh, injector bungs and custom fuel rails and welded them together and machined out uh, the areas of the intake so it would be ready to uh, convert it to kind of a spider EFI type intake. Originally, I considered a Kinsler EFI individual runner type intake. I also have a sheet metal tunnel ram intake set up for two dominators. Unfortunately, both of these intakes had severe clearance issues with my late model distributor. The distributor came out of a, I think it was a mid-90s Ford truck with a thick film ignition. The thick film ignition is what my EFI standalone computer is programmed for, and because it's so old, it's not something I can have readily reprogrammed. The Cleveland 335 series and the Ford Big Block 429 and 460s share the same distributor type. The other change to the distributor was a brass distributor gear to be used with the solid roller I had custom designed for this engine. This wraps up the intake installation. Comments, feedback, and questions are definitely encouraged. Subscribe and stay tuned as the next episode will catch up with a variant motor disassembly, mock-up, and reassembly, which took place previously.